Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. It seems like a couple of people, a couple of new folks to Brain Club, and that's so awesome. Um, I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns, and I'm the executive director here at All Brains Belong. And welcome to our kickoff of the month of autistic culture here at Brain Club. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to share screen. Or that's not even the correct date. Awesome. So anyway, um, by way of introduction, all forms of participation are okay here. Um, you can have your video on or off. And even if it's on, we do not expect anything of you. We certainly do not expect you to look at the camera. Um, my camera's in a different place now because uh, uh, Tracy Rue from the Vermont Assist Technology Program helped me get my computer up on yoga bolsters. And like now I can see the screen better. So plug for the Vermont Assist Technology Program. Anyway, um, uh, you can move or, you know, like do what needs doing, however you're most comfortable. You know, we don't expect you to sit still, you know, walk, move, fidget, stim, eat, whatever. And everyone is welcome here at Brain Club. Um, people, people of all ages, so just keep that in mind, especially because a lot of people do participate with video off and, you know, there might be, um, lit, uh, you know, lit, little ears nearby. So just keep that in mind with topics discussed and language and all that. All right. Anyway, you can communicate however you want to, un, you know, unmute and use mouth words, type in the chat, whatever, what, what, whatever works for you. And um, a word about language, I think, um, especially tonight, you know, we're, we're joined by community panelists, and I think you'll hear a variety of, um, of, of, of terminology or language that people are using to describe their own experience. And so we want people to feel comfortable using whatever words they use to refer to their own identity. Um, when I speak about autism, I use identity first language. I am autistic, because for me, Autism is part of my identity, um, and um, uh, the, the, though the you know research shows that the majority of people um, uh, you know in, in, in research studies of adults um, prefer identity first language, that is not universal, um, and um, everyone is welcome to use what language that about their own identity works for them. Um, speaking of identity. Um, affirming identity, all aspects of identity is really important to us here. Um, and um, related related to that, you know, the the safety, creating safety. How do we cue safety? I think that comes in a variety of different ways, and we'll talk about that next. So first off, just naming, um, just 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 naming the shared understanding that today is about education. It's not medical advice, and individual traumatic experiences are best processed in a therapeutic setting, of which Brain Club is not. Other aspects of safety. We want to be creating space for people with a broad range of communication access needs. And given um, how, how common it is that maybe we don't necessarily perceive time, or maybe we aren't necessarily, you know, um, you know, the, the, the conflicting access needs of if I have the kind of brain that communicates, you know, in 20 minute monologues, but there's other people who I mean, I'm also one of the people that can't listen to 20 minute monologues. So like we're balancing this, we're constantly navigating the conflicting access needs. And so we just want to normalize that. Like we're going to have conflicting access needs and it's completely part of the, 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 the norm here to be talking about access needs. Mind access needs are. Um, and as we, you know, tonight, um, our, our panelists, um, many, many of whom are here here live with us today, um, but the um, we do have a pre-recorded set of interviews that we're going to play. Um, it's going to be about thirty minutes, and then we'll have plenty of time for discussion. Just keeping in mind the big picture of to make sure that we're creating space for people who want to participate in conversation to be able to do so. That was really long-winded. Speaking of twenty-minute monologues, last bit of access needs related topics. Closed captioning is enabled. You just have to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. So depending on what version of Zoom you have, look for the live transcript CC icon. And if you don't see that, find the more dot, 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 and choose show subtitles or hide subtitles if you'd like to turn them off. OK, so why did we designate this month of April? 
to talk about autistic culture. Well, um, many people are observing autism awareness month or autism acceptance month, like all of it. Anyway, for many people, April is hard. April is awful. Um, and, 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 and though, of course, it's not universal by any means, it's just that for many people, it is distressing to see or hear um, the way that autism is regarded by many people in this world. And so um, part of part part of what we endeavor to do as we um, as as we create community here is to provide something that is um, countering that you know dominant narrative. I'm going to play a little bit of a snarky video clip, which I impulsively decided to build into Brain Club. I have to stop and then reshare. Okay. So um, if you don't follow the All Brains Belong Instagram account, this ran this weekend. I hate about April, 2023 edition. Number one, puzzle pieces. Number two, fundraisers that benefit organizations that use puzzle pieces. Three, any conversation about autism that does not center the perspectives of autistic people. All Brains Belong is a all right, so that's where today's brain club comes from, because we we do want to be centering the perspective of autistic voices, and we will be joined tonight by five autistic adults who were identified to be autistic as adults, um, ranging from being identified in their 20s to their 60s. And um, all month long, we will be talking about uh, various various some um, ways in which um, we would like the conversation around autism to be um, to be about destigmatizing the autism narrative. So um, before we um, start our uh, pre-recorded interviews, I just want a, a huge huge thank you to our panelists. Kelly Bordeaux, Amy Noyes, Sarah Knutson, Matthew LaFleur, and Zeph. Thank you all so much for sharing your stories with us. And with that, David, you ready? All set. Okay, go for it. And we'll have and we'll have the chat going. I'll have it open and I'll be and and um, you know, so so you're 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 welcome. Welcomed if you'd like to participate in conversation in the chat as this is going, feel free. All right. All right, here we go. Okay. So when did you learn that you were autistic? And what has it been like to get to know your brain? I only recently like had somebody else say, hey, you're right, you're autistic. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so it, I don't even think it's been like six months that I've like comfortably said it to other people like and feeling confident like no I got someone backing me on this right. um but I have always questioned my neurology because because of the things because mm -hmm. people do the things so easily and it always befuddled me like how I mean just in school how do you just walk in on the first day of school and and just do the things and not and not be freaking out like you know, how does that happen when i knew i was autistic i was late diagnosed in uh in january uh after my physical which is age 23. Okay. And that was, you know, when, you know, the SSI and SSDI program wants to make sure that, you know, to continue, I had to go to a psychic, psychiatric to continue my benefits. And that was, you know, through the healthcare provider. And that was by law. Mm -hmm. um, and that experience, and I found out that I was autistic then 
But like I said, I've also had multiple disabilities that, you know, ADHD when I was young. Mm -hmm. uh, then, you know, dyslexia, dyslexia within that ADHD form. And then, you know, cognitive speech issues, stuttering of my own words. Mm -hmm. uh, that is when I knew I was different, you know, thinking differently. And my brain was working very differently and it sees the world in a different, you know, spectrum, but it sees it in a different place, you know, of its own, you know, its own reality and mm -hmm. its own kind. Mm -hmm. And my brain, you know, I actually love my brain the way it thinks because I can see the world around me, but also I can see the world in me through other people and see their experiences, discussions, difficulties, and, you know, conversations through a whole different set of lens. I first heard the idea or um, someone asked me specifically, like autism was not on my radar at all for myself. And, um, but I had gone to see um, one of my spouse's college friends who I didn't, I had never met before. And um, I wasn't a person who like shared a lot about myself, but I found through the weekend of hanging out that I um, was sharing a lot. I was in a really challenging time in my life. And um, it turns out that two years prior, they had been diagnosed with autism. And so um, the last day we were hanging out, we were in this really, really large, uh, restaurant um, and in New York City, and it was really, really loud and tons of people. And um, but we had gotten to know each other enough that it was like there was this comfortability. And in that conversation, that's when they had said, like, had you ever considered autism? And ne I had never. And I don't I like it didn't even cross my mind. I had very like stereotypical ideas of what it meant to be autistic. Um, but they did this thing that like really changed my life. Um, they put noise canceling headphones on my ear, on my head. Wow. And they did it, like they put it on. And so there was something in the act of this connection with this person. And when, when they put them on, I think that they could see a shift in me. Um, it was so palpable to have all of the stimulus and in that connection with them in that moment it was like the whole world like went away for a moment and i think it was like really in that moment i knew and even though i didn't know no and and but i got excited and i got really curious and i had come into contact with a blog or something that was written about the alien on the playground and it was about an adult diagnosed um, assigned female at birth person who felt very alienated throughout their childhood. And I read this um, blog and recognized myself in it. Mm -hmm. At the time, I was partnered with somebody who had been diagnosed with Asperger's, which is a part of the spectrum, but that's what they were calling it when he got diagnosed. and. I found the RADS Ritvo scale online, which is a clinically validated assessment tool. It's correlated between people who have autism and people who don't. And I took it and he took it. And my results wound up being even farther off the charts than his were. And that started me trying to get attention from my medical care professionals that I suspected that I had autism because um, it says on the RADS Ritvo, if you score in this range, take this into your doctor to be assessed. I worked for about a year and then wound up in a space for about four to six weeks where I just couldn't do anything. and. And around this time, I was, I was, I would consider myself an autistic burnout and I, I couldn't really leave the house and I was having 
you know, up to 10 panic attacks a day. Like it was just, my nervous system was just, everything was shutting down. And um, that was right when the lockdown happened. And so um, it was like, it saved my life. It felt like in a lot of ways, because now all of a sudden there's no um, social interactions. I don't have to hug anyone. I don't have to set any boundaries for myself. I don't have to be anything for anyone. And it was, it's when I came out of, um, I realized I had been an autistic burnout. Fundamentally, it took me, it took me another couple of years to actually get diagnosed with the autism, but reading that article that enabled me to self-diagnose and really started asking the questions was kind of like this kaleidoscope twisting into focus where everything that never made sense about my life finally started making sense. And yeah, I've been suspecting that I was autistic for a long time um, or, you know, 10 or t 10 or at least 10 years, maybe. Uh, and I'm 60, uh, a little over 60. So, um, so I guess there it's, what it's i think the thing that's been the most important to me is really sort of finding a community of people right about a year after that i found abb going into the fox market a little market in um east Montpelier, and they were donating tips to all brings belong for that month and when i saw that um this is the place for me this is like this is where I get I'll start being able to exist in the outside world because that still wasn't part of my experience and uh, ABB to me has been a way to have community have social connections to understand my body to reframe mental illness into you know autism to to um, take medicines that, you know, simple medicines that have been able to make my mobility and my um, ability to be in the world different. And um, so I would say, like, the, my therapy gave me a space to um, be myself in a way to, to myself, and ABB has given me a way to be myself and in community with others um, that I hadn't had in so long. What does being autistic mean to you? Honestly, the first thing that comes to mind is trauma. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't want to be a downer or anything, but being an undiagnosed mm -hmm. autistic for most of my life, I've had a really hard time with social trauma. I've had death threats as a result of me not understanding either social cues or what people are saying. And um, I have CPTSD that my psychiatrist has identified is as a side effect of having autism. Mm -hmm. Other than that, it basically means that my brain has differences in the way that it works and processes information. There are some things that it does really well. There are some things that it really sucks at, um, but Fundamentally, I don't look at my autism as anything that needs to be cured. I look at it as a part of the natural standard deviation in terms of what is normal. Uh, if I had to guess, I would say, you know, from an evolutionary standpoint, that most of us are probably really, really wired to be incredibly sensitive to social context and social cues and what the, what the rest of society um, wants and, and needs and what other people are doing. And in a large way, that's great. It helps us to all get along. But if a whole society is off base, um, then or going in a direction that isn't so good, evolutionarily, there probably needs to be at least a, a healthy minority of people that are able to like, not be so wired cued into what the social world thinks. I think that's healthy for society to have that minority. And I think it's really hard to be in that minority because that difference is not at all appreciated in the mainstream. Um, can you talk a little bit about the strengths and the challenges that you feel like go along with being autistic? My biggest, you know, brain strength is insight and knowledge, you know, 
a world around me, plus the environment, if it's toxic or welcoming. And, you know, for me, that's my, that's my biggest strength is, you know, my brain is thinking fast on its feet and how, and the way it sees the world's perspective view. My brain's weakness is, is trying to comprehend or doing, doing too much overriding, comprehending the situation Mm -hmm. and trying to analyze it in its own way but there's too much you know background brain status noises that it makes it hard for my brain to comprehend on what to focus on i'm really really good at things like pattern recognition i rely upon pattern recognition for survival um i'm also really good at working with things that are really complex um I have an ability to see both the forest and the trees at the same time. I guess what it means to me to be autistic is like to sort of be the moral, a moral conscience or an, a, a sort of a, 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 an outlier to the rest of society saying, uh, outlaw, uh, an outlier or an outlaw to the society I'm living in be saying, I just don't see it the same way you do and it doesn't make sense to me and I think you're going in the wrong direction in this way and that way and this other way and that you could be doing it but and and so it's and so I'm often on the on the outs of it and yet you know 20 years later I'm often not wrong so um and it's a long time to wait and by the time everybody else is caught up I'm usually on to finding something else that I don't like (laughs) so there were just people understood things that I just didn't seem to understand and I didn't know where they were getting the information you know like had Google existed as as if I was a child like I would have been googling that all day long like why is it so easy for people to do this stuff like you know all throughout school I was a solid like I loved the middle of the school year. Like (laughs) you're in your groove, you got your notebook that's already half filled in, you got the rest to go. There's no beginning of the year icebreakers. There's no end of the year zigzags. You're just on your path. And I've always said that about myself. And now I can kind of like look back and be like, well, duh, yeah, (laughs) of course, of course that makes sense. it was comfortable. I knew the rules. I knew the expectations. That's when I tended to be more engaged in class because I just, I understood the expectations, but beginning and end of anything is just so challenging for me. Um, Uh, I can feel like I'm nervous um, to talk and that's like part of it is like the excitement. It can cue on safety in my system. Um, And, um, and so I just want to like name that for myself. all of the ways I had felt different um, or been made to feel different around like pickiness, being overly sensitive, controlling, highly anxious. Um, uh, Even though I had those were all kind of separate points or relationships in my life, all of a sudden it came into this clear view under this one umbrella of uh, of this, um, you know, neurobiology or this difference. Um, I think of it differently now, but, um, and so in that exploration of that, um, so I had always was, you know, very sensitive. I was always um, shy. Um, It was really hard for me, but mainly what I was discovering was I had an inside world and I had an outside world. So I would go into the world and I would try the best. I would study um, human behavior. I was very adept of understanding and really sensitive to energetics within how people were leading, which was often very confusing because I could tell if someone was dysregulated, even though they were acting like everything was fine. But in my social environment with my peers, it was really difficult because I could sense when someone was was challenged, but if I pointed that out or I was direct around it, it would often get turned around like something wrong with me or. But I've had to work really, really, really hard to actually care about other people mm-hmm. and to actually, and, 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 um, and to, um, 
and and to uh, uh, and to and to connect with other human beings, and to so, so I the, the challenges are I I often get in the way sometimes of good things and maybe many times of good things that other people are trying to make happen mm -hmm. just because it doesn't work for me. Mm -hmm. And just because I don't understand why it works for other people. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's sometimes hard to know when it's really important to take a stand and when it's just like I'm being stubborn and I don't like being left out and I want to do it my way. I'm exhausted all the time of all of the thought and all of the effort that I have to do in advance to be successful in the future. Mm -hmm. And I didn't see other people doing that. Like, mm -hmm. My husband can get up out of bed 10 minutes before he's got to leave the house. And he's just, and I'm like, are you kidding me? I get up at like 5 a.m. Even if I'm not leaving the house, just to like prepare myself right. for the day. I need, a, I need an ease into my day. I can't just get up and, and go. Painful. It's like, oh, I'm always, you know, and it, it just, it's the reality of being autistic. It's, it's like, like, I'm always, I, that's just how my brain works. It does, it works differently. Right. than the culture that most of the people uh, in the culture I am in. And I believe evolution designed it that way. And what I, the th a thing that I think I would love to see our culture change is the way that we deal with outliers, because I don't think outliers are mistakes. I think outliers are necessary for a society that needs to be self-reflective and the, the best of humanity is kind of self-reflective. So it, it, I, I think, outliers are a good thing not not a, not a not a mistake of nature even though you know they slow down corporate production how is your life different since learning that you're autistic all of a sudden like by saying by started saying i'm autistic and, and learning about the autism community all of a sudden there's this whole group of people that's like oh my god instant sort of social connection that um Otherwise, I would sort of find piecemeal, um, case by case, um, uh, um, and you know, it's, you, I mean, you still have to make friends, but at least it feels like you're, it's a, uh, it's like the community itself is has the feel of human community, the kind of human community I've been looking for for an awful long time. I'm glad to know because it gave me more grace with myself. Mm -hmm. And it also just connected my son and I a little bit more, you know, when I told him, he was like, well, of course, mom, that makes so much sense. You know me so much more than anybody else. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I guess it does kind of make sense. Again, I'm the tree. You're my little apple, you know. But not being diagnosed as a child, like I went, had to go back through my life and in the grief of that and realizing like, oh, I always cut paper. Like I would just cut paper all the time. I realized, oh, this where's my stems. Mm -hmm. You know, I watched t a ton of TV. It's where I got all my social understanding. Mm -hmm. um, I was often like really, um, like physically my face would change. Like if I was hanging out with somebody, I would start speaking like them. I would start... Um, I would take up their interest um, and, but then I would go home and just be very um, able to be in my own world, listening to songs over and over again. Um, and so when I was taking the quizzes, it felt like someone was entering into my world. Like, how do they know that about me? How do they know that I have a fascination with running water? How do they know that? Like, it was like someone was peering into my soul and I felt known for the first time in my life, just from, just from reading the questions. So um, at the time I was in tremendous amount of uh, internal struggle. And so I think what happened for me was I, I entered into that world. And so I became very quiet and very curious about myself for the first time because I realized there was this quality of dissociation when I was going out into the world. Um, and I was really doing a lot of work to try and undo that. And to, but I didn't have any awareness of my body. I didn't have any like ability to like self-reflect in the sense of like, I could self-reflect as like, how did my behavior affect the other person? But I had no ability to reflect, how am I actually being affected by what's happening? And there's a really big difference in that for me. Um, and so I think that was the first time all of a sudden sounds were coming in. And so I wasn't just getting unconscious pain from it. I was actually getting very conscious pain. In fact, my husband one time said, 
are you getting, is this getting worse or is this getting better? And I realized for me internally, it was getting better, but how I was living or how I was acting that out was getting worse for the world. So much of what they're saying is wrong with my kid are ways that I am, are ways of my being. And so I bring that up. I'm like, you know, I think he actually does that because I do that. You know, like that would make sense to me. You know, I, I'm a stay at home mom. He's with me all the time. Yeah. Of course he's going to do that. Yeah. And um, they're like, well, that isn't a thing that, you know, neurotypical people do. And I'm like, oh, that's fascinating, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. uh, and, you know, then I met Mel and <laughs> things yeah. just went from there. And, you know, me receiving my diagnosis was such a difference from when my child received his. We were, and I mean it when I say we were literally handed a box of tissues when they said he's autistic. Well, he's on the autism spectrum. Oh, Here's your box of tissues. And like oh. my husband and I are both like, great, thanks for the answer. Like next step, you know, what do we great. do? Great. And when Mel told me, she was just like, congratulations, you're autistic. Yeah. And I um, what do you wish parents of autistic children or the broader community knew? Oh, what do I wish parents and or the autistic community broader knew about me? One, I wish they knew that we're all in this together as individuals that, you know, that sees things differently, hears things differently, and moves things differently. Mm -hmm. To me, the broader public that are, you know, parents and autistic individuals that knew about me, that I'm very, very compassionate, supportive, and I do take a leadership role when necessary to support those individuals that may not have a voice. They may not even know how to speak, you know, with their voices, or they may not understand what we're talking about because that's not that's not the way our brains act re in reality work you know everybody's brain is thinks differently and acts differently and for the autistic community uh it's about you know understanding other people's brains works mm -hmm. and how to connect with that brain and a meet and having a meaningful conversation and discussion within that brain pattern of an autistic individual, whether it's parents or children, it just having that conversation with them makes them feel like they're welcome. And, and a bigger part of the, not only a bigger part of a picture, but a bigger part of a family together. And that, I would like to see more of is that value and welcoming sense of we're all in this together. We all help each other. Let's move forward together so we can, you know, be the best we can be to educate others about, you know, our special strength. What do you wish parents of autistic children or the broader community would know about what it's like to be autistic? I think I touched on that also. I just think yeah. it's like change the perspective on outliers. We're necessary. We're let's embrace the let's let's as a humankind let's embrace the outlier perspective for what we can learn from it and for what we can learn from seeing life through the eyes of the outlier through the eyes of outliers that we would never see because that we that we would never see because of the nat the natural bias of the majority. Yeah. And uh, and 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 the natural and the perspective of the majority and how the majority is going is is wired literally wired to see things differently, and so as a culture, if we sort of embrace the idea of the of the the, the value the social value that people bring is broader than economics, and we need to bear the burden, or, or, or the we need to gain the benefits and bear the burden of of a of a diverse culture, then we need to find a way to support everybody um, emotionally, socially, economically, and make space for all of us and, um, and, and, uh, and, 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 tr and truly, and, and, and be truly committed to 
the guests that each person is trying to, each person's spirit is trying to have them offer the, the, the world they live in. One, I wish people just understood that our brains were different, period. It's not something that we can control. But two, don't pathologize the differences and don't pathologize and or ostracize us because we are non-conforming. But less of a tragedy, mm -hmm. you know, because yeah. it isn't like, yeah. I, I made it to 46 years old all the while questioning, but mm -hmm. you know, I, I experienced a very classic, you know, when I told certain family members, are you sure, you know, you, you have, you have like college degrees. I'm like, yeah. The thing that I would love like people to understand is that, um, first of all, what I'm speaking about today is like my own experience yeah. and that I think it's really important to understand that everybody, um, gets to have their own experience and their own access needs. And even though there may be like traits or characteristics that overlap, that is not actually the experience of being autistic. Uh, being autistic for me means being unto myself, being individual and allowing myself and whatever my needs are, or whatever my sensitivities or whatever my extraordinary abilities be. And it gets to be a collection of my human experience. And I think the other thing in terms of like what I would want, like the broader community to understand or what I would want my family to understand or parents of, of, of autistic people, um, family members of autistic people is to that. Um, that it's so important to allow difference to be a wonder and allow yourself to be different within even your relationship to someone who knows themselves to be different and to be curious and to ask questions and to, instead of presume because I could be having a really sensitive um, sensibility right now to a noise that's happening and if there's an assumption of what that noise is that was not going to help me but if there's a curiosity around what does that feel like in your body or could we identify what the sound is it's such a radically different experience for me and so i think um for me like even like my you know my face is all red i'm really flushed i'm super nervous i want to be here part of that is my excitement but part of it is having the attention on me of like how will i be perceived you know am i safe but also just like, that's not an easy way for me to exist if the tension is directly on me. Like I've got to find another way or I get to observe the experience. And so I think it's just really important that folks know and understand that there's no one way, but more curiosity you can have, less presumption around what people's actually experiencing. It could be an opportunity for openness. Wow. I, I just really want to express how, how much I appreciate the vulnerability that all five of you should and your willingness to share, to share really really important aspects of your life narrative. Um, because I think, you know, what, what is just continues to just, I have no words to describe this really, but like all of the pain that comes from feeling broken and alone and defective and that you're the only one who is so broken, like, like, I mean, we, 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 we watched five different people who coming from all different perspectives and experiences 
who had so much in common, just the five of you. And as you're talking in the chat, everyone's like, me too. Oh, wow. Me too. Oh, wow. That's, that resonates. Like, just, can you imagine what life could have been like if we all knew each other as little children? We were laying down the initial story of our lives and who we are and what our value is in society. Holy cow. So it feels, um, you know, I, I, th though I'm about to say, you know, we have 15 minutes, um, like it's not just 15 minutes, it's like a lifetime of dialogue, right? So um, I, 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 I would just, um, I, I, I just want to open, open the floor up for anyone who would like to share anything, um, either, either with mouth words or in the chat. I will read in the chat, many people sharing, um, thanking, thanking you all. Um, your bravery and your stories brought me to tears. There's so much that resonates with me from everyone's stories. Thank you for sharing your amazing thoughts and experiences. Mel, I just wanted to say thank you so much for your amazing job. I felt really touched by your um, the way in which you put us all together. And when at the very end, I was just thinking like, oh, yeah, wouldn't it be amazing if we were all together? And Sarah's like the idea of like, oh, outliers unite, you know, <laughs> um, that we get to to be able to share. Because even within the community, everyone has a lot of different experiences, but because it's allowed we get to learn more and then start weaving together as a community. And so I appreciate everyone listening and um, I'm really grateful and honored to have been able to share uh, some things that I've never shared before. So um, I look forward to, to having more access to that and to be able to share, continue to share. Thank you, Amy. Uh, Kelly's saying something similar um, in, in the chat. It's such a, uh, you know, to have, it's all been interviewed separately, but all speaking together. It's like weaving the fabric of the narrative. And though, of course, there's every individual is going to have an individualized experience. I think we, 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 we heard some real threads of commonality um, that I think is really powerful. Reading in the chat, um, uh, thank you for saying that diagnosis of, uh, often results from autistic burnout, and that happened to me. Is the diagnosis? Oh, oh, oh! Interesting. Um, that's interesting. Okay, sorry. I'm like commenting to myself while reading. I'm like doing that thing where it's anyway brain. Anyway, um, so so the diagnosis experience uh, was uh, for um, for for nature or lover. Um, uh, for the diagnosed experience was so traumatic as well as the written report and it's taken me five years to recover myself and maybe I'm not back to normal my previously functional self yeah that's 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 really interesting what I had what I had meant to say in the chat and by the way you are not the only one whose diagnosed experience is traumatic that is a common story um so it's you know both is true so the diagnosis experience when it's not done in a neurodiversity affirming way is traumatic and the, 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 the other thread of that is that reaching autistic burnout is often the impetus for diagnosis because, you know, and, 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 and this, we'll talk a lot about this next week um, at, the, um, at, at, at the Autistic Health um, Brain Club, um, but, but the, the, the DSM-5 criteria are autistic stress behaviors. The more dysregulated you are, the more likely you are to manifest stereotype. And that's, that's why um, when, because what, what autistic burnout is, and um, we're going to, um, I, I, we, we really, really do need to do a burnout. I mean, a brain club on autistic burnout at some point. I just think, anyway, um, we figure out how to do that well. Um, but 
I mean, it comes up in every bring club every week, right? But like, and it, anyway, um, point is, is to say that, you know, what autistic burnout is, is it's when your capacity is exceeded by the demands often for years to reach a state of physical and mental exhaustion where skills are lost. And so, you know, ju just like in like the early developmental period, it's talked about, you know, like regressions, that's autistic burnout. Um, uh, my child got her autism diagnosed. I mean, my, 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 my child has always been autistic as we all were, um, we all have been, um, but um, my child lost the ability to speak um, when after getting a minor upper respiratory infection when she was two, she lost the ability to speak for six weeks and in that context got her diagnosis. Um, I, I, I already knew she was autistic. It was just that like this, this was burnout. And I think with adults who I think we heard several times in these interviews of like, I couldn't leave the house. I couldn't talk for, you know, I couldn't do this thing. I, I deliver, I, you know, I really specifically remember um, this, this day that I like, I couldn't motor plan brushing my teeth. Um, you know, it, 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 that's, that's, that's what this is. And I would really love to get to a place where we don't have to reach profound levels of dysregulation before people come to understand their narrative and have the Zeph experience of the kaleidoscope. But that's in a world where the, the, the dominant narrative is deficit-based. That's, that's, that's what this is. Um, uh, C says, I'm going to be processing and holding space for all who shared today and the week to come. Very powerful. Thank you for using spoons to be so vulnerable. Absolutely. I could not agree more. Um, uh, Nature Your Lover says, um, yeah, some professionals are trying to tell me I was depressed, but it was Cora that cued me into that it was autistic burnout. <laughs> so so well said, right? So, I mean, how many people have had the experience of they discover their true selves because they see themselves mirrored like in an infographic or a, a, a forum or a, you know, a YouTube video or like whatever it is of like, how, how did the people not know? And like, just all the, all the people that get misdiagnosed and, and invalidated. Um, uh, Kelly says in schools for a long time, you, you need to be unsuccessful in order to receive support. Exactly. Um, yes. Um, so Lizzie, thank you for sharing in the chat. So if you are registered for brain club for the month, like you don't need to do anything extra. It's the same, it's the same link. Um, but we, we decided to create a separate listing for next week's with the idea that like, um, so, so I, 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 I'm going to be updating the talk, but it's a talk I gave last year. Um, uh, and, and we're going to go through specifically like how, how did the autism narrative get constructed? Like what's the history on that? What's the backstory? It turns out it's a story of corruption is what it is. Um, and that's the narrative that is in the DSM. It looks very, you know, the current, the current, uh, autism construction from DSM five, it, it looks pretty similar to the, you know, the 1943 narrative. Um, so anyway, um, that's, 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 that's next week. Um, and, and, and then, you know, that's, but it's, 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 it's not all like, uh, you know, we'll also get into like, you know, how do we, how do we do it differently? How do we move forward as opposed to like, you know, being stuck, stuck in the, the, the current state of affairs. Kim says, autistic burnout has been one of the most defining experiences in my life. Okay, so we've got a lot of, lot of interest in talking about autistic burnout. I think what we'll do in May, I think what we'll do is like, you know, maybe we'll, we'll just think about like, you know, fine points of the autistic experience and, you know, this being like a major one of them. Yeah, I think, I think, I think May, yes. Kelly says, I've never thought of regression as burnout, but whoa, it totally makes sense. Yeah, it aches to think of all the littles when they regress. Yeah. And including your son. CV says the motor planning piece is also not talked about much when in burnout or in general. Um, yeah. Kelly says, and burnout can manifest in substance use disorder, eating disorders, but more especially in teens. Yeah, I think that, you know, all of these, all of these, you know, while not universal, like more often than not, these, these, these commonalities of like entirely predictable. Yeah, it's interesting. So yeah, if May is autistic burnout month, we recover from autism acceptance month. <laughs> uh, 
I love it. Yeah. And like, I think that, um, you know, we, in our medical practice, we meet, we meet so many people who, who, you know, present an autistic burnout. They of course don't know what that is. Um, but that's the, that's the path to clarity is, is reaching such profound levels of, of, of pain and, um, you know, in, 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 in a world where, you know, when, when, when we think about like connection, the co-regulation experience coming together in community, like, it's almost like it's, it's, it's pretty hard to emerge from autistic burnout without community um, and without, you know, a culture of interdependence um, of like relying on other people. Um, because I mean, part of autistic burnout is you have to figure out, you know, what, what's, what's draining your spoons and eliminate whatever you can and shift the equation so that that balance of capacity and demand can, can, can become more net, you know, net, net neutral. And then you, you know, part, part of defining what, what that paradigm looks like, I think comes from being part of community with other people doing it too. Kelly asks, how do laws around neurodivergent healthcare change? Um, I think there's so much there, right? So, you know, how, how you know, sometimes we think about like, I mean, so, so there's, there's things that are represented as law that are not law. They're just like, folklore and myth. So it's like really distinguishing, like, do we really understand the law? For example, um, uh, in the state of Vermont, there is no law around uh, what types of professionals can make an autism diagnosis. It is represented as though that is the case, but that is not the case. Um, there may be regulations around um, what type of professional making an autism diagnosis then entitles you to um, adult disability services, um, although having a diagnosis doesn't necessarily um, open that door for, for, for a person anyway. Um, uh, there may also be regulations around what types of professionals need to make an autism diagnosis in order for insurance to pay for applied behavioral analysis. In my practice, we don't send patients to applied behavioral analysis, and so that is irrelevant. Um, so I think that just reading in the chat. Um, uh, Nature Lover says, after a trauma resulting from my expression of ethics in a corrupt environment, I was diagnosed with PTSD, which uh, may have been correct, but um, now I wonder if that was my first experience with burnout. Yeah, yeah. Um, Kelly says, parents can keep a diagnosis from their kids and schools have to respect this. Yeah. And I think that, you know, the paradigm, the paradigm of, you know, of, of that this is something that, that should be hidden and that's the stigma. So I think this starts with, you know, rather than think about this as laws and regulations, we work from the ground up of paradigm, the way that you see the world ultimately is going to dictate, you know, everything that comes next. Um, so, um, Kelly. I just have to, it was so much easier to say it than type it um, in response to schools keeping a child's diagnosis from them if the parents request it. When my son went to public school, I would give an autism talk every year to his classroom. And one year I gave the talk and the next day, one of his classmates, a little girl came up to me and she went, you know, when you were talking about Phineas, it felt like you were talking about me. So I went home and I talked to my parents and I have Asperger's. And I was just like, oh God, are these parents coming after me now? <laughs> but I was so secretly like happy for her because that was one less person walking around being like, what is going on right now? And how come I don't get it? And now she kind of gets it a little bit. So that's my little, I, I ruined a parent's want, but I made a kid know themselves a little bit better. 
Amen. What a beautiful story. I've never heard that story before. That's, that's, uh, I, I love that story. You know, I think that, um, I, I forget who said it in the chat earlier, is that, um, uh, what, that, that it may have been Zeph um, around um, people feel, I've always known I'm different, and then the world has a way of affirming that, right? And so, so that, I think every, I mean, people, that, that is really common. And so when you don't provide a child a lens for understanding themselves, you don't give them a narrative, they make one up. And that narrative is I'm broken, I'm defective, there's something wrong with me. Steve says, uh, people in general don't know how to, how to respond productively to the information that someone's autistic. Yes, so, so, so true. Right. I mean, it's, it's, yes. And so there's the stereotypes that people are, you know, that they, they have in their mind. There's the, you know, just, yes, there's so many, there, duh, all of that. Um, I think that, um, but, but back to the idea of uh, withholding diagnosis, I mean, those simply, you know, that, that, that wouldn't happen if, there was no stigma about that label label like this is just um it's it just is what it is it's like this is how I'm wired and so that's where um and and uh, as as Kelly says I you know I was diagnosed as a child but wasn't told until late 20s right like just how, I'm so sorry that that happened to you And so I think going forward, it's about an, um, Lizzie, if, if you have it at, if you, if you have it anywhere at the ready, otherwise I will look for it. The, um, uh, the, the video we sent out in our newsletter today, I made a couple of years ago, um, about how to talk with kids about neurodiversity. Um, it's not that hard. Um, it's like we all have different brains. Here are some things about brains. Um, and you just develop a shared vocabulary around it. And then when people get to know about things like brains, sensory processing, motor coordination, you know, brain sending messages, brain sending messages from brain to hands, for example. Um, um, you just when we have certain patterns of, you know, things that come easy and things that are harder, as long as we give those names. This pattern's called autism. Not a big deal. When I have that, oh, thanks, Lizzie. Um, you know, when, when I have conversations with my autistic patients, you know, five, six, seven years old, like, it's like, high five, like just, you know, nearly immediately after diagnosis. Um, I mean, nearly immediately after diagnosis, it's about like, let's have a conversation about how I can, how I can support a family for having this conversation. Um, but like, it, it's, it's, it's just, it's part of it. It's part of it. Like, thank goodness we have found a way to understand how your brain works. That's amazing. And that's not to say that Things aren't really hard. Things can be hard. Things are hard. Things are really hard, like a lot. And one of the reasons they are so hard is because the environment makes them so hard. So there's that. But more on that next week. Thank you all so much for this really important conversation.